Welcome to Two Travel Dads Podcast. Here we share our favorite destinations, travel tips, ideas for saving money, and stories from our adventures. Be sure to check out our show notes at twotraveldads.com slash podcast dash episodes. Hey everyone, this is Rob with Two Travel Dads Podcast. And today we got kind of a different sort of podcast episode going on. We've got a couple of wine folks with us from the Santa Maria Valley in California. And if you've been following our blog for a couple years or a couple months or whatever, um, you know that we love this region, not just because it's a really great and pretty new wine region, but because there are so many things to do, whether you're a foodie or you want to just be in the outdoors, whatever it is. So today I'm excited to really dig into wine. Um, first, I'm going to let Norm introduce himself, then I'm going to have Wes introduce himself, and then we're going to just start talking about the wine industry in California, what's happening right now, and how everybody can visit or be a part of it from a distance. So Norm, why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, I'm Norm Benbecco, of Cottonwood Canyon Vineyard and Winery. We have a gorgeous 78-acre property in the Santa Rey Valley, and we're about 550 feet elevation and about 19 miles from the Pacific Ocean. The Pacific Ocean has a big impact for both Wes and I, or the Miller family and I, uh, because of its, the mountain range, which runs east to west versus north-south, which is the more common, or causes the ocean to impact the vineyards before it hits the mountain range. So it's a different growing region compared to other areas in the country or the, uh, the world because of that. And because of, we typically have a cool climate, which is ideal for growing Chardonnay and Pinot Noir, and sometimes Syrah, two Chardonnay and Pinot represent, I think West can confirm it's about 75 to 80% of the property in Santa Barbara County and wow. relative Santa Maria Valley might even be higher. So, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. And it's a, uh, it's a great place to grow minus the cost to grow because of, because of the cool climate and the natural humidity that prevails almost all the time. We have to manage our vineyard daily because the moisture created by the ocean has a negative impact on the, on the grapes as well as a positive impact. But the negative impact causes us the financial uh, hardship and the constant spring to prevent the mildew from developing and destroying the, the clusters. Yeah, and, and that's a good and a bad. I mean, I, I think I wouldn't change if I could plant this anyplace, I still would stay here because of that. So the cost are one issue, um, but that's just part of the game. And I like the quality and the style of grapes, the wine we make, we don't do anything to the grapes. We just process them, don't, don't add anything. Other than towards the end, we add sulfur as an antioxidant to prevent it from having a problem in the bottle. So other than that, it's all naturally done. Uh, we don't manage our vineyard the same way because I, I'm just not a fan. And Wes technically is really much more equipped to talk about that than I am. So I'd be curious to see his input. But anyway, this, we bought the property in 1988. Uh, it was all Chardonnay and there were about 500 vines in an acre, and we now have from 1,600 to 4,400 vines per acre. So we've replanted, and it's almost time to replant again. So we're at the uh, life of the vine, so which is about 30 years from a productivity quality standpoint. So that's it. We sell only direct. We sell through our wine club and through our taste room. Uh, recently, we put in a 650 seat amphitheater, and we started doing weddings. This was our first year, and guess what happened? COVID-19. Yeah. So now we have 2021 sold out and people are booking out for 2022 and we do no advertising for anything. It's all word of mouth. Wow. That's awesome. I, I love that. I know coming from Washington, that's a huge part of wine country are the amazing events, both private events and public events that everybody can do. So that's really cool that you guys are able to go into the future with that. So sweet. Cool. Thank you for the intro norm. And then, Welcome. um, Wes, if you could kind of share the same same bit, your what you love about the different types of grapes that you get to work with, all that stuff, whatever whatever floats your boat, share away. Thank you, and uh, greetings from the gorgeous Santa Maria Valley on one of our few summer days. Uh, we're gonna have less than six days this year uh, over the high 80s, early 90s. We're expecting the hottest day of the year this year in the Santa Maria Valley, around 90, 93 degrees. That's really gonna get the uh, sugar moving in these grapes. So most of the grapes in the Santa Maria Valley 
have been already picked uh, by October 1st. Probably still see a little bit of Chardonnay hanging out up there, maybe some Syrah. But we've had a gorgeous year. And the thing that makes this region so special is we generally have 350 days out of the year between 65 and 85 degrees as a high. So if you like to be outside, if you like to hike, if you like to golf, if you like to uh, experience the manifest beauty of, of everything that California has to offer, uh, halfway between sort of LA and San Francisco, halfway between Santa Barbara and San Luis Obispo is exactly where we are on a cool little escarpment uh, that really doesn't, as Norm said, um, it really doesn't have many geological or geographical um, stopping points between the Pacific Ocean and our vineyards. So I like to say on a normal summer day, we see the fog from the Pacific, we see the sun from the, the desert east of us, and the fog and the sun fight right over our head, trying to decide, uh, you know, is the ocean going to win? Is the summer going to win? And that movement back and forth keeps us so cool that our average high temperature in August is 74 degrees. So there's no such thing as air conditioning here. We get it from the Pacific Ocean. And then in September and October, we get these little heat, uh, uh, these little kind of heat spikes to punctuate the vintage. So our vintages are always long, cool, windy, foggy, punctuated in September and October by these heat spikes, which really dictate the quality and expressiveness of these vintages. And we're very lucky to say that uh, this year we were not impacted here in Santa Maria and on the Central Coast uh, by fires and smoke. So we're extraordinarily lucky that uh, the vintage looks like it's gonna be really extraordinary down here. So I've been here since 1994 and I'm starting to get my head wrapped around what it really takes uh, to make uh, to make wine in the Santa Barbara County. And I've also worked on a number of uh, different American viticultural areas and the creation of those uh, four different AVAs in Santa Barbara County that I helped write and, and do. So I have, um, I'd say, you know, besides being a winemaker and a vineyard manager, I'm, I'm pretty aware of, of the soils, the climate and, and how those things really impact uh, the quality of the wines that come out of Santa Barbara County and the Central Coast. That's awesome. So you guys both have talked about, you know, the AVA and the weather. It's fascinating because when I have talked with winemakers in the past, um, you know, being up in Washington, they are all about, you know, the terroir and talking about the soil, soil, soil and what makes Washington wine so spectacular. You guys went right for the weather being that big element. Do, do you think that you guys also are impacted by, of course, you're going to be impacted by the soil, but do you think that that um, kind of volcanic rock that is just north of you guys that kind of is underlying everywhere, do you feel like that has a huge impact on the quality of grapes you're growing as well? Or do you really attest it all to that weather? Well, I'll start and then Norm can, uh, Norm's been doing this longer than I have. Okay. <laughs> um, we're, we're basically growing grapes on uh, a Pleistocene and a Miocene seabed. Um, no longer than 20 million years ago, we we're probably all underwater here. And then basically uh, when the Juan de Fuca uh, tectonic plate, the Pacific plate and the North American plate made this incredible, incredibly violent um, sort of tectonic action that, that caused this area of, of California to rise uh, to be dry land, we've only had 20 million years for that uh, sandy seabed to develop into a soil series. So our soil series are basically sand, some more sand, and then a little bit more sand. We don't have snow here, but I have actually found out that about once every three months, I need to actually brush the sand coming off of the Guadalupe dunes off of my driveway. We are having a constant influx of sand from the beach, and that just keeps our vineyards uh, very sandy. And how sandy soil impacts the grapes is the vines don't uh, have no opportunity to be very vigorous because they have no, no, uh, a lot of, not a lot of nutrients and a lot of, not a lot of clay in the soil, which exchange nutrients in grapevines. So with these sandy seabed soils, our vines are small, our clusters are small, our berries are small, and the amount of juice in each berry is minimized. And what that does is produce wines of great character, great flavor. And as you can see in the glass uh, from the 2018 uh, Jay Wilkes Pinot Noir, uh, can produce some pretty intense color and saturation, uh, effusiveness, deliciousness, and intensity. So we grow elegant wines with intense flavors. Yeah. Yeah. And I can say that this Pinot is really beautiful. It's a beautiful 
ruby color against our blue sky here in Florida. So it's, um, yeah, I'm loving it. <laughs> and then Norm, did you have something to say about the, um, the actual soil and everything too and how that impacts your winemaking? Well, yes, let's go back to the wine you're drinking. Yeah. Uh, 2010, we had an unusual climate change. We had a massive amount of heat for, I, I can't remember the amount of time, but at least 30 days, maybe 45 days. And Sharon's block actually got to 110 degrees. Whoa. And <laughs> consequently, our hang time, which is what we really strive for in, in this part of the world, in the uh, ABA, is the long hang time gives us a, a relationship between the juice and the skins that is really outstanding and gives us a retention of a lot of high natural acidity, which ages, allows the wine to age a long time, which is what our trademark lo logo is, distinctively different age-worthy wines. And it's not something that I do uh, in the wine making process because I really don't do anything. I let the grapes go do their own thing and I, and I got a wine, a Syrah we call Patience, which I age 40 months in oak and I only open the barrel once. So that yeah. natural acidity creates a, a dynamic product which is different than most places. I like to tell people that comparing ourselves to the French, the French do a great job under their circumstances which they have weather issues and government control issues. And the if we take our Chardonnay and we have multiple levels of Chardonnay depending on the style that we're trying to generate, the French have real high acid, but they don't have fruit re retention. We have the same acid level as the French wine, but we have fruit retention. So it's really different. And I, I love to put our wine side by side against some of the great chateaus and, and, Chard and the Chardonnay block of uh, France and to see the difference. Some styles are similar, but again, our dominance of, of the fruit makes us distinctively different. That's awesome. That's a great way to describe that. <laughs> so moving on from the actual growing of the grapes and your guys' thought process about what, what your area builds into that, how do you guys like for customers or for wine lovers to really enjoy and experience your wines? Do you? I, I know that um, I heard wine club thrown out there and pre-order, things like that. Do you facilitate a, um, a pretty flexible wine tasting experience at each of your wineries? Is it something where people can show up on a Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. and do a wine tasting? Or do you guys really, especially with COVID, try to pace out um, how many visitors you're able to allow on property? How are you running things right now? <laughs> let, let, let me respond because uh, here's an example that whoever they are, I don't know who they are making the decisions, said that now, in our case, we were pouring five or six wines at a tasting. They required us to have a separate glass for each tasting, which we couldn't enforce because we'd have to have someone full-time just doing dishes, which would be unproductive and uneconomical. So we changed our format as because of the COVID-19, which is now, as you can understand, is a greatly different format, like restaurants in Florida. Now, we have a different problem here because our winter time is coming, and drinking and tasting outside, it's not going to be really feasible because the temperature is going to drop so much. Yeah, it's so, going to be short-lived. <laughs> it's going to be short-lived. Yeah, they won't be out there too long. And we can't start a fire for obvious reasons. So what we're doing is we now, if you see in the short term, instead of doing a tasting because of the restrictions we have, uh, and we have tons of space, we could easily probably hold 150 people here and be complying with all the requirements as far as social distancing. Mm -hmm. Because of our space, we have multiple um, patios. Uh, we have um, we have a cave area, which is about 70 yards down below us. And out that outside there, we have seating for about 300 people in normal conditions. So subnormal, we could probably hold 100. So um, that's been a big change. So now we say you come in, you can have a, you can buy a glass of wine, you can buy a bottle. And I think at this stage, I am going to stay with that format unless I see that's re getting some negative response from customers. But we customers seem to prefer that, so we're going to stay with that direction for a while. What happens under the new rules? I just saw the we call the different tier levels here in Santa Barbara, the new rules for tastings at restaurants and et cetera and gyms, and they had no provision for wineries. They've ignored that. One of our major sources of income 
is our uniqueness in our caves. So we take people down on a cave tour and walk, walk them down in two different one direction and come back another direction so that we can educate them on the growing techniques, the processing of, of the grapes when they come in and the aging of the wines in the, in the caves as well as in our tank storage system. That's the important part of our identification. And as far as I know, Wes, you can probably respond to that. I think we're the only winery in Santa Barbara County, uh, let alone Santa Maria Valley, that does cave tours and barrel tasting. And we can't do that. They've outlawed it. Mm, that's tough. So it's, yeah. And, and we're still spending $25,000 plus a month just to manage our vineyard. Four weeks ago, five weeks ago, we had half our crop unsold. The misfortune in Napa has become our fortune. So that's allowed us to sell all but the last eight tons of Syrah, uh, which we just put on the market just now. That's a big change. But this runs in cycles. Our turn will be next year. Something's going to bad happen next year to Santa Maria Valley. Hope not. Wes, no. what do you think? Well, respect, respect for Norm, the way he makes wine, which is incredibly uh, rare in this world, even in Europe, um, in the sense that if you look at wine sales, 85% of wines purchased in the United States are consumed within 48 hours. So most people's wine cellars in the United States basically is the backseat of their car on the way back from Trader Joe's or <laughs> wherever. Norm has taken a different look at it. He, what Norm has done is he said, Americans like to buy wine and drink wine. So he ages it himself. So when he's, it's released, it's already in a state of balance. It's in a state of complexity. It's, it's in a state of, of maturity. Most wines, um, and this is true of the Miller Family Wine Company, we have to play the broad market. He's going all 100% direct. We're going 95% broad market, which means we're selling to restaurants, we're selling to supermarkets, we're selling to wine shops, we're selling to all the places where wine is drunk on premise and off premise. And our entire company, all you know, seven brands that we make, uh, represent somewhere around uh, 100,000 cases. So. It's a kind of a different gig for us. So we found that COVID is limiting uh, how much on-premise wine we're selling, wine that is consumed at a bar, at a restaurant. So we've tried to sort of supplement our direct-to-consumer market where Norman's been living for almost his entire career. So we are increasing our wine club. We invented the Miller Family Wine Club, which sends three bottles of wine anywhere in the country where it's legal for 40, under $40 a month, three bottles this month are all 90 plus scoring bottles of wine. So great value. So we're looking at that uh, direct to consumer or DTC channel. Um, I hate the word pivot, but that's obviously something we've had to do during COVID. It's the um, word of 2020. <laughs> it, it kind of is. And we uh, have a tasting room down in downtown Santa Barbara, just, just literally steps off the beach at 35 State Street. Sweet Bee in Santa Barbara. Our tasting room has been absolutely, because we've moved everything outside and Santa Barbara has one of the greatest climates year round, we will not have any problem having people outside tasting wine unless it's raining and we still have umbrellas, so that will probably work out. But as we're seeing, um, hopefully more people wearing masks, more people trusting science and more people staying healthy, we're, we are seeing a change in Santa Barbara's laws where we probably will be able to start moving people indoors at about 25% capacity, uh, which should be fine because that way we can do a little music, have a little, you know, uh, have a little food and all these wonderful things. But really for us, it's been all about how do we get wine to the people that need it? You know, how do we make sure that, so we did some great specials early in COVID and increased our direct to consumer sales by over 1000% oh, between wow. April and May this year. So it's a new environment. We're adapting as quickly as we possibly can. We are focusing ed on education, on media, like this wonderful podcast, uh, doing uh, wine shows weekly, uh, and really trying to get people uh, not only in their, in their uh, quarantine and their less than uh, you know, normal circumstances to learn about wine, to understand our brand. Uh, and as we emerge from this, hopefully get people uh, to recognize that uh, the Miller Family Wine Company kept them uh, educated and kept them flush with wine in a very difficult time in their lives. Now, so I know that Norm was mentioning that they've had to switch it up to doing just like the just a glass, just a bottle. It sounds like you're still doing full scale wine tastings just outside. Is that correct? 
Yes. So um, we've been we've been basically doing uh, full wine tasting uh, down in in Santa Barbara, full flights. There was a law for a while that if we wanted to stay open, we had to serve food uh, with all wine. So we hired a chef uh, to do charcuterie um, and uh, sandwiches and paninis and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of we were we had to sort of be almost a restaurant wine bar for a little while. And now as things are starting to calm down, I don't think that uh, people have to order food to get wine, but I've always felt that having food with wine just fills in the opportunity. I don't think wine can be understood without time, love, and food. Uh, you take either time, love, or food out of it, and you will not be able to understand a wine for what it really has to offer. Every wine deserves an hour, uh, delicious things, and people in love. Uh, that's, that's where wine can really strut its stuff. And I, I agree with Wes. In fact, in most of our back labels, I put a food pairing suggestion because of that. Yeah. And speaking of Santa Maria Valley, we're very lucky to have the Allen Hancock College, where I've been teaching food and wine pairing for the last seven years. So we do have a, a bunch of chefs and a bunch of retirees and a bunch of young people that come into this class and are really learning how wine matches with food. And I would go so far to say wine is food. And uh, it's liquid humanism, it's food, and it's just it's just, it, it's, it's being able to travel. Come to Santa Maria in a glass tonight. You can come to Santa Maria wherever you are in the world. You can come visit Santa Maria tonight. Just the, the journey is gonna happen in your mouth. The journey is gonna happen in your nose. The journey is gonna happen in your brain. But if you pay attention to a glass of Santa Maria wine, you can smell the ocean. You can yep. feel that sandy soil. It is a representation of a time and a place. Wine is truly a quantum experience. Yeah, I saw a great sign that said, wine is theater. And I think that that's exactly what you just described. <laughs> Another thing that I was kind of curious about in terms of visiting and, you know, encouraging people to come out and explore Santa Maria and actually make these multiple stops. Um, when you guys are comparing Santa Maria Valley, when you're comparing your tasting room with some of the more commonly known areas like Napa, what would you most, um, most liken the area too in terms of it's just the wine culture and visiting would you say that you fall on the very unpretentious side would you you were talking about you know classes and pairings and stuff would you say that santa maria is working its way up the um enlightened side of wine where, where would you say it all falls that's that's a complicated issue because there's so many of us in the county or in Santa Maria Valley specifically who are small. There's some big guys also, but it's a different, the decisions for small wineries versus big wineries is not necessarily compatible. We look at different ways to generate the enthusiasm for the wine, but we're, we're lacking the ability to coordinate and to pull our resources to make us a more national phenomenon, which we deserve. We don't have the reputation of the Napas, but we're just as good quality for the Chardonnay and Pinot Noirs probably better than most of Napa. So it's a different growing area and we need to make the world know about it. And that's where we're falling down as, a, as an association or a group of people. We're trying to find ways to improve that, but that's been because of COVID-19 put in a uh, abatement for a while. So yeah. Wes, what, I don't know, Wes, what's your feeling? Well, I think Santa Maria Valley has um, some, of the, some of the most positive elements uh, of our environment for growing grapes, what you would call terroir, the environment, the weather, the soil is just perfect for the production of cool climate, specifically Burgundian varietals like Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Another great benefit we have in Santa Maria Valley is we are a bona fide agricultural community. We have a built-in agricultural community that gives us uh, sort of uh, workers, expertise, managers, people coming out of Cal Poly, people coming out of Allen Hancock College, all of these wonderful colleges that surround us. We're also sort of a small pond. So the people that want, don't want to go to Napa Sonoma because it's already saturated, good luck becoming a famous winemaker in Napa Sonoma without $25 million under your belt. But you can graduate from UC Davis, come down to Santa Barbara County, get yourself an assistant winemaker job and end up launching your own label in 10 years and making yourself you know, a, a living. So it's a small pond, it is developing. Um, it is underappreciated for sure. Areas like Santa Rita Hills, areas like Ballard Canyon, some of the areas down a little bit south of us are getting a lot of attention right now. Santa Maria Valley was the third AVA established in the United States and the second AVA established in, in California in 1981 after, um, after Napa Valley in California. So we're the third oldest American uh, viticultural area. 
Uh, and I think part of it is we've been growing such good Chardonnay and Pinot Noir and through Byron and Cambria and some of these older, uh, uh, larger properties have really showed the world how sexy these wines can be. But then, you know, uh, other areas come in, Sonoma Coast, uh, Santa Rita Hill, stuff like that. They become like the cool new kid on the block. But as people recognize where the greatest value of balanced, delicious, elegant, almost European styled wines are coming from in California, I don't think any region can touch the quality, the ageability, the deliciousness, the balance of, of what we do here in the Santa Maria Valley. Um, plenty of hotels, plenty of tasting rooms to taste. You're in a central location where you can go to Arroyo Grande, Edna Valley, Santa Rita Hills, uh, San Inez Valley, you know, Solvang. All these areas are within a half an hour of Santa Maria Valley. So Santa Maria Valley, I think, and the, the chamber is doing a good job. And thank you uh, to the chamber for helping us with this program. It's really important to understand that Santa Maria Valley is wine country and it is an affordable way and a place to stay and to use as a hub to explore all the wonderful regions of Santa Barbara County. Yeah. It might and not be as curated as Napa, but it's also so much, so less expensive. You're not gonna be asked for 50 or hundred dollars to taste someone's wines by a woman with a cravat, you know, punching cards <laughs> as you go in. And if you join one of our wine clubs, congratulations. Now you are someone we will never say no to. We will offer you a level of hospitality and a level of inclusiveness within our industry that will be surprising and far more valuable than your price of admission. Yeah, and I think that something with, with 2020 and I, I think 2021 being so restrictive in terms of travel, I can see a place like Santa Maria Valley really growing for that drive to market of people who normally might plan on like a Napa weekend to go wine tasting stuff from LA or San Diego, they can so easily drive themselves quickly up to you guys. And I think that's, I would love to project out there that that's going to be the big theme of the rest of the year and into 2021 is that drive to wine tasting weekend getaway is going to find its new home with you guys. Everyone, including the people in Horse Heaven Hills, including the people yeah. all the way through the beautiful places in the Pacific Northwest and the, and the deserts of Washington that grow such beautiful wine. Everyone should be supporting their local wineries. And we want to be LA's wine country. If you want uh, an area to go to and you live in LA, say you live in Pasadena and it's 110 degrees in, in July and August, it's going to be 75 degrees up here. Come on up, LA. We're ready to really, really take care of you. And we are your wine country in anywhere. I don't care if you come from Iowa, from Maine, from Florida, you know, from Oregon. The difference between Oregon and California, we love Oregon people down here. Californians aren't treated as well up in Oregon because most of them are self-loathing ex-Californians. <laughs> let's just get down to it. Everyone is welcome here. Please come in and uh, experience the inclusiveness, uh, the love we have for every kind of people. Um, every kind, you know, show up, enjoy our wines. I guarantee you'll take a couple cases home because the wines are a quarter to a half of uh, half the price as Napa. And we're producing some of the greatest wines in the world for the money. And I think Norman and I would both agree, there's nothing better than getting home after a trip to Santa Barbara County and bringing back the flavor of the place to share with your friends in those wonderful 750 milliliter glass bottles. And just remember, Rob, three of the 10 largest wine markets in the country are San Diego, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. And you just so, happen to be conveniently located between them. Yes, we're right between <laughs> them. It's easy drive and there's lots of hotels and those who people who play golf and drink wine, we have a unusual heavy amount of very nice golf courses which are open year round. That's awesome. That's a good call out too, is the combo of recreation and wine tasting. It's a perfect pairing. We're starting to kind of run out of some time, but I wanted to hit on harvest with you guys because I know I know a lot of a lot of California growers are facing fires either directly in their vineyards or very close by, which I'm not sure how much smoke impacts you know the actual fruit, even if it's not burned. Um, but that was something that I wanted to just ask as like a novice question, and then also hear about what's going on with your guys's harvest and how visitors can participate in that. I know I love being able to, where we just moved from on Bainbridge Island, there was a small vineyard there that would invite people out for picking and for trimming canes and stuff like that. So I'm kind of curious how you guys also offer that out to the public. I'll, I'll tell you a little story. We did a couple of years ago, we did a, we let consumers come in and pick some grapes off of a certain block. We had a luncheon for them. 
and of course we had wine at lunch. And because of the, we had so much food and because of the thought process, we invited the actual normal workers who were picking grapes uh, all night long and during the day, et cetera, et cetera, to come and have lunch with us. When they walked in to have lunch, that is the Hispanic uh, picking crew, all who were having lunch and had picked for the first time stood up and clapped because they were given the recognition of this is not an easy job to pick. They were very grateful to see that these people were sharing their skills and their labor and their time to pick the grapes to our standards that Wes and I hold for making uh, these good wines. And it was a thrilling concept, but I've had a hard time getting people to come back and do it again after that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I've done it once, and yeah, it's it's a bit backbreaking. But. As I like, yes, as I like to tell uh, my my previous volunteers at my previous uh, career at Clo Pepe Vineyards, um, the uh, romance of picking grapes usually lasts for ten or fifteen minutes, and <laughs> you'll also feel intensely. Um, under uh, under qualified when you see how fast these uh professional grape pickers are going to be moving past you and and just shredding how fast you can go and if, if you think those guys are good you should see some of these guys that use the little razor hooks up in napa that can pick three tons in a night here's the deal with harvest right now without you know involving myself in some type of viticultural schadenfreude um the problems up in northern california specifically in napa sonoma have caused a lot of that fruit to absorb a lot of very heavy ash, which basically makes the grapes unusable and the wines being made from this fruit will have what's called smoke taint, which means the wine will taste a lot like a wet, uh, a sort of a moist ashtray, which most people really don't enjoy. So the nice Norm was talking about, he had a lot of fruit uh, needing to be sold. And what we're seeing is a sometimes even a doubling or even a higher amount of uh, uh, increase in price of grapes on the spot market, grapes in Paso, grapes in Santa Maria that are Santa Barbara that might not have been picked this year because of COVID that are now being uh, heavily sought after in the bulk market. If you have wine in the tank that needs to be sold, the price of bulk wine is absolutely skyrocketed since this. So first of all, thank you to Cal Fire for what they do. They're the best at the world at what they're doing. Thank goodness they've saved so many properties and I feel horrible for the people that have had losses, but uh, California, uh, we're the sixth largest economy in the world. If we were our own country, we will be okay. We're coming back in a huge way. We're supporting each other. And um, I'm really happy that Santa Maria Valley, Santa Barbara and Paso can continue doing what we've been doing since the early 70s, which is sending grapes north to make, uh, Santa, you know, to make Napa wines better. Um, this is a tradition that's happened since Brother Timothy was making wine, you know, uh, up, up at Novitiate, uh, you know, and the Christian brothers, they recognized immediately how good the fruit was down here. And I always like to say Santa Maria Valley making Napa better since 1974. <laughs> but harvest is going well. We're hot right now. So the last of the fruits coming out of Santa Maria probably today and tonight. And we're seeing Paso is going to be up in the easily up in the hundreds today. So we're going to see a lot of that Cabernet and a lot of the Nebbiolo and a lot of the Zinfandel coming out in the next few weeks. So I would say easily by mid to uh, easily by, you know, not only will all the fruit be in probably by Halloween, a lot of us will probably be barreled down and done with fermentations around that too. And there will be some winemaking sort of, uh, sort of languishing into uh, probably November, but by the first or second week of November, I would say most wineries in Santa Barbara County and Paso Robles would be what we like to say buttoned up and barreled down, which means it's, it's time for a tropical vacation and, uh, Maybe a cock. Come to Florida. <laughs> Happily. So right now, clearly the Santa Maria Valley is open and ready for people to come and visit to have some wine country experiences. What would you recommend? Should they just plan a weekend and go? Or um, what would you say while things are still kind of restricted? You can make it here. Santa Maria is a wonderful place, as I, uh, as I said, to find a hotel as a central point for going off and exploring the central coast. The weather is perfect. If you live in an area where it's not an average of 74 degrees in August as a high temperature, you might imagine what a wonderful place this can be in summer. Uh, get yourself a hotel, make some appointments. You can uh, obviously go to MillerFamilyWines.com, jwilks.com. You can go to the MillerFamilyWineClub.com. Join our little monthly subscription wine club. 40 bucks a month, you're going to get some of the best wines you can ever imagine great, great value. And if you're going to come out to Santa Maria Valley, if you're going to come out to Santa Barbara County, even if you're going to go someplace 
up in Washington, Oregon, um, I would love to help curate uh, a wine adventure for you. And you can reach out to me at that same, uh, at that, just go to any of the websites that I mentioned and you can find my email uh, right there and how lucky we would be. Napa, Sonoma, sometimes you get a sense that you're just one more visitor. Trust me, when you come to Santa Barbara County Wine Country, you're gonna really understand that we are extremely excited that you have chosen to come to uh, a wine region that is as old as, uh, as uh, the ABAs in Napa, but also really, really appreciates each and every customer and will give you some really uh, amazing attention and some of the greatest wines you've ever tasted for a very, very reasonable price. On a, on a standpoint of Cotton with Canyon Wines, that, so if you want to get all Pinot in your club shipments, you can get all Pinot. You want all Chardonnay, get all Chardonnay. You want to mix, you can mix. We have a unique club called the Connoisseur Club, which we age, which the wines are 10 years or older, minimum. And that club is very unusual in, in any place, but it's the nature of our wine that it just ages beautifully. Our limitation tends to be the corks. So we've had a lot of cork failures over time, uh, but we've alleviated that by switching to screw caps. And so if you want a wine that's age, we can provide that. You want a wine you can drink right now, we have that option available. So a majority of our customers have wine cellars. And when you come and visit Cottonwood, we teach you not only about the wine food and food pairing, we teach you about how to hold the glass, how, how to sniff the wine so that you get the maximum flavor out of it. And people are scared uh, when I say, you, if you want to enjoy our Chardonnay, which is five or six years old, decant it for six hours, you'll see a tremendous flavor change. And they look at me and say, God, you don't know what you're talking about, do you? <laughs> but when I, when I let them aerate their glass after they've tasted the wine, showing what a 30 second aeration of swishing the glass around, how it changes the wine to taste like a good French uh, Burgundy, they're astonished. They're astonished because the mindset is California wines don't age. And unfortunately, we can prove that wrong. I love talking with winemakers. It's always, it's always fun to hear how they understand the nuance of different types of grapes about the process of, gosh, from winemaking to actually like getting it onto people's tables into their glasses. It's, it's really fascinating and fun to talk with people. And I've really, I've really enjoyed our chat today. This has been great. Incidentally, I enjoy listening to Wes. <laughs> Wes, is, Wes is a natural teacher, and I applaud him for any time he speaks because I learn something from him every time he talks. He's, just, he's so charismatic. He's, he's remarkable. Yeah. Good thing you can't see me. Uh, you know, because I, I had a, I had a, uh, I had a flat top at the beginning of COVID, and now I look like Jerry Garcia. One reason, probably, Rob, why you love to speak with winemakers is we're doing something that's so authentic and so ancient. Uh, it's not like we're pushing paper. It's not like we're moving zeros and ones around. We are literally growing something and making something that traditionally has made people happy. And wine is something so special. And it brings us together. I like to say that a bottle of wine is an investment to keep people at table for an extra hour every day. And damn, during COVID, we, why not make it two hours? Where are we going? Let's, <laughs> let's bring table back to American culture. If you're more interested in what I have to say about wine, I do a weekly wine show on Wednesdays and Fridays at Jay Wilkes Wine Santa Barbara Facebook, as well as on Zoom on Fridays. And uh, also check out our, our uh, YouTube pages at Miller Family Wines if you want to learn about the history of wine, how to taste wine, or even uh, learn anything about wine right there at the Miller Family Wine Company's uh, YouTube page. So awesome. thanks so much for letting us uh, letting us sound off. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, and. Everybody who's listening, we've got show notes that um, are available on twotraveladads.com as well as a link that you can follow um, from wherever you get your podcasts. And on there, we'll have info about each of the wineries, about um, the different labels and impressions within Miller Family Wines, um, info about each of our guests today, both Norm and West, as well as anything that you could want to know and that I can provide about the Santa Maria Valley agritourism and also um there are going to be direct flights coming into santa maria valley yep. starting i don't know if they've already started or starting soon but it's going to be so much easier to get there um from a variety of places so woohoo! exciting stuff all around thank you guys so much for being with me today um i appreciate it this was so much fun i am going to save the rest of these pinots that i've got here 
to share with Chris because he couldn't join us and I think he's going to be thrilled. So thank you. <laughs> it was really a pleasure having Wes and Norm on here with us. It was great to talk about Santa Maria Valley wine and tourism and actually how to visit. Be sure to check out the show notes on twotraveldads.com and give us a subscribe so you don't miss anything else in this season of the podcast. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Two Travel Dads podcast is written by Rob and Chris Taylor and produced by Rob Taylor in Suquamish, Washington. If you would like to be on Two Travel Dads podcast or sponsor it, please visit us at twotraveldads.com slash work.